Hey everyone, this is Julia J. Gibbs. Um, we, this is session two of Genesis, and I feel like Vanna White because I'm going to use the whiteboard today. Um, the ladies in my study were saying, we need a visual. <laughs> and so I, um, a very sweet friend, Stephanie, brought me that with all these markers. Like, I'm gonna tell you, if you know my personality, this is not something that I would be able to pull together. I'm not a detail-oriented person, and so I need great friends that do things like this for me. So I appreciate it. All right, we're in session two of Genesis. Um, we're gonna go to the Lord in prayer and start there and um, ask the Lord that God, that you will speak over us, that Lord, um, that the message that you put before the foundation of the earth was formed, that you will pour that into us, Lord, and that, that we will hear you, that we will be transformed, that we will be changed by the goodness of you. In your holy name we pray, amen. So um, last week we went over the oddity of the concept of the gap theory, or a gap theory, I really should say, um, in Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. So we're not going to get into that at all today. And um, we're going to move on and look at Genesis 1, 1 through Genesis 2, 3. And this is the entire seven day period um, of creation. So I just wanted to start out by telling you the coolest thing about Genesis 1, 1 is just like the book of Revelation. Remember, um, we're talking about how circular in nature Genesis and Revelation are, that um, no one could have passed down Genesis 1-1 orally. So, so much of Genesis could have been passed down. When you realize Adam lives 930 years, Seth lives 912, Enos lives 905 years, Canaan lives 910, Mahalalel lives 895 years, um, these guys are living a long time. So when you look at, and if you're interested in this kind of thing, look up Sumer, um, look up the Sumerians, and look up all of the pictures of the angels that they have, of the, um, sorry, my, this is of course always when my family members want to text me a million times, is when I try to make a video. Um, so when you look at these religions, I mean these early Sumerian or the Sumers, you will see several things like the tree of life. Um, and you start wondering, well, where do they get these pictures? Adam, okay, he's alive um, during this time. Remember we talked about last week how um, the creation of seven days gives you 7,000 years of mankind and it follows along with the time of mankind. Mankind will have 6,000 years before millennial reign, which is the seventh um, thousand year. And we're going to look at that a little bit today as well. But realize that Genesis 1 is a chapter that could not have been passed down by just oral tradition. Remember we talked about last week that um, who wrote the book of Genesis? Jesus himself tells us that Moses wrote the book of Genesis and that in Jewish tradition, the book of um, Genesis could have been, we don't know where, but could have been given to Moses at the moment in, um, when, you, when you read the story where Moses says, can I see you to God? And he says, no man sees me and lives. It's impossible to see God and live, but I will hide you in the cleft, right? And I will have my goodness pass by and you will see where I've been, right? You'll see my glory, the, the trail of it. And so the tradition is that the first five books that Moses wrote, um, the Tanakh, or, um, that Moses wrote down, was shown by God to Moses then because he could not see his face and live. So he showed him where he had been. Literally, he showed him the beginning. Okay. And that that was where um, Moses wrote down the book of Genesis in this beginning time period, um, which I love that picture because this literally is where God has been. But the thing about Genesis 1, um, when you look at that with Moses writing these things down is this. Moses could not have gotten Genesis 1 from oral history any more than John could have gotten the book of Revelation from oral history, um, um, from oral history, because man was not in Genesis 1 until day 6. So grasp that concept. 
Genesis 1, just like the book of Revelation, man cannot tell what's coming tomorrow any more than he can tell what came before him. There was no man until on day six in Genesis 1. The story of Genesis 1 is about God. He is the main character. The word Elohim in Genesis 1 is used more than 30 times. Um, this chapter is seeped in the main character of the Bible. And the main character of the Bible is God himself, the Trinitarian God, Elohim. God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son that are all a part of chapter 1 and how they came um, to make mankind and make the earth that we dwell in now. Um, another similar, I think I was trying to remember, is Psalm 2. If you're interested in seeing more of, of God as the Trinitarian, read Psalms 2. It is literally a conversation between the Trinity, um, which is really interesting. So when you see that um, the beginning of the Bible starts just as the end, as it ends, it begins by God telling the story, by God the main character speaking. Um, and Revelation is the exact same. I love that in Revelation, um, I think it's 19, that um, after the marriage supper, yeah, marriage supper of the Lamb has happened, and um, John falls on his feet and starts worshiping, and um, an angel picks him up and says, don't worship me, I'm a servant just like you, and he says, "Do you, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, he tells him, do you realize, John, the spirit of prophecy was all about Jesus. The book is about God from the beginning to the end. He is the main character. So um, when we start this book of Genesis, realize the parallels that you have with um, Revelation. So it's an amazing um, circular nature to this book. And that's why I believe that in Isaiah it says it's declaring the end from the beginning. Um, and a few other facts that we need to look at. Um, realize that Genesis 1 is so simple that my five-year-old can read it and see the awe and beauty and truth in it. But it is so complex that if you get into, remember Hebrews, every Hebrew letter is also a Hebrew number. If you get into the math that creates Genesis chapter 1, if that kind of thing interests you, please go look it up um, and dive into that. It is fascinating um, the math that adds up in this. So it is simple enough for a child, and yet it boggles the minds of people like Stephen Hawkins, who um, in the movie of The Theory of Everything says, I want the theory of everything. What is the theory? And to this day, he's looking for that theory. And his um, soon-to-be wife in the movie, I love this moment, she looks up at the stars and then looks back at him. And when he says, what is the theory of everything? She says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he cannot accept it, and he rejects it, and he spends a life searching for what she answered right there. Do you want the theory of everything? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So it's um, simple enough for a child, but difficult enough that someone as brilliant as Stephen Hawkins cannot grasp what this means. Um, a couple of fun things in here is that the word bara that we went through, which is in the beginning God created. Um, remember, we went through that um, last week. Created is bara, B-A-R-A. -A. And that bara is used, so B-A-R-A, -A, okay. Bara is going to be used four times in this um, maybe I should stand up, right? Like be super teacherish. Um, but Bara is going to be used four times. So it's used um, in the first time is in Genesis 1 1. And that is going to be about the material creation of Earth itself. And this, remember, Bara, this kind of Bara means X. Mila, right? Um, it means um, out of nothing, okay? Um, philosophers have argued from this over and over, but I will tell you, mankind cannot create ex nihilo because 
we have to create out of something already created. We do not create something that was nothing out of nothing. And that's what this bara means. And it's used four times here. It's used for the material world. It's used in um, 121. Okay, so it's used in 121 when he creates DNA, life of animals, right? And then it's used in 126, and that is when he creates man. He creates man out of nothing in his image. And finally, it's going to be used in 2, 3, and it's used to create the Sabbath. Specifically, it's used to make the Sabbath holy. Out of nothing, he creates and makes it holy. So um, that's a little bit of math for you. Um, also, realize that the three days of day one, two, and three correspond with day four, five, and six when you look at the creation days. And remember, for our um, study, creation days start on in verse 3, Genesis 1, 3. And um, 1, 2, and 3 correspond with 4, 5, and 6. Let me tell you what I mean by this. First, the shell of each thing is created. Then it is filled. I was thinking about this concept that over and over, we went through a little bit of this last week. It says, I did not create things to be void and desolate, but he created it to be full. And um, I have to tell you, as I was praying over my middle son today, it hit me of the reality of this, that we as beings were not created to be empty, okay? We were not created to just search and search and find no meaning in life. We were not created to say, I don't believe in anything. I'm just going to exist. We were created to be vessels for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to be filled by God, we were created. And so even in this corresponding that you see of day one, earth is made. Day two, you have the expanse. Day three, the water and the land. Well, guess what? Then he's going to come in and put vegetation. Day four is about filling the earth, right? Day five is about the living creatures that will go on the land he's just created. Day six is coming in with man to dwell on the land and the waters with dominion. He fills what he creates. And even in this picture, we see the theology that God has made with mankind. I was not created to just be an empty vessel walking through this life, but I was created by God to be filled with um, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be filled with Ruach that would live in me and then transform me into the likeness of Christ. So when you feel empty and alone and um, just the depression of life comes on you, hear me. It is because you were made to be filled that the correspondence that has to happen with forming you in the womb is that you come into salvation. And this is shown to us even in the six days of creation, of the making and the filling, the making and the filling. Same thing with Sabbath. He made the Sabbath, but as we will get into in a little bit, it had to be filled by Jesus in order to be complete. So the next thing I wanted to get into is that, um, or just point out to you before we move forward, is that there are 10 commandments given in this very short chapter one of the Bible. So you see that as he created the earth, he gave 10 commandments, he spoke and realized that every time he does it, let there be life. And God said, let there be an expanse, let the waters be gather gathered, let the earth sprout vegetables, let there be lights to separate the day from the night, let there be signs for seasons and days and years, let there be lights in the expanse of the heaven to give light upon the earth, the stars and the galaxy, let the waters swarm with living creatures and birds, let the earth bring forth living creatures, and finally, number 10, let us make man in our M image. Realize that God spoke into being. What does John 1 tell us? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When you see in Genesis that God is speaking into being, it's Jesus 
by the power of God through the vessel of Jesus and the outstretching hovering of the Holy Spirit, a Trinitarian God is creating this earth. And so you see that in the beginning when the earth was created, 10 commandments were laid out, just as in Exodus 20, that as Israel is being created a nation, once again, you get 10 commandments. You see the pattern. God does not just randomly choose to do things. The Bible shows us that God is a God of order, of pattern, and that if we search the scripture, we can find these things and know him more. I mean, our earth is full of pattern. We see it over and over, day, night. The other thing um, that we're going to get into is there are three blessings. Realize that it is in the days five, six, and seven that something brand new happens. It's not happened in the Bible ever before. God blesses, okay? Um, you see that he blesses three things and they all are about life. God is a life giver, the author of life. He blesses DNA um, when he blesses, uh, do, 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 do. and this is in um, chapter 1, verse 22. This is the first time, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply. This is to the animals, right? Second, this is to the birds and to the fish in the sea. Second thing he blesses, you see in 128, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Who is them? Man. Okay? Remember, um, in Genesis chapter 1, man is mankind, right? And you see that he created them, who's them, man and woman, in the image of God, and he blesses them. It's not until chapter two that we come personal, all right? Right now it's a big picture. In chapter two, that man gets a name. His name's Adam. And in chapter two, Elohim becomes Adonai. So you get these personal names. Um, I always joke and say, not Eve. Um, <laughs> I, I always cracks me up. I'm sorry if it's not funny to you. It just really is to me. Eve isn't named until the end of chapter three after the fall. And I tell my husband all the time, that's why she had so much struggle because they called her woman. <laughs> Till half of her life, right, in the garden. And then she gets a name. Adam got a name, but she was just a woman. And she was like, you call me woman one more time, right? Now, um, I'm totally joking. I don't think that's true at all. But it always makes me laugh to think about that. Um, so he blesses um, DNA. He blesses man, right? And he blesses the Sabbath. Finally, you see in chapter 2, he says, um, chapter 2, verse 3, so God blessed the seventh day and made bara it holy. He made out of nothing it holy. Think about that concept. Holiness literally is a creation of God. And in, in that verse... So, um, and we will get into what the Sabbath was. The other one is that we really need to, I can't remember if we went over this, in the, so I'll do it quickly, is every single day, um, one through six, is um, has a very interesting closing. Day seven does not have it, and you'll find it at the end of every day. So remember, um, you start in chapter three and um, verse three, um, and then you jump to five. It says, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. All right. And this happens again. And there was evening and there was morning the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day and the sixth day, not the seventh day. Um, I want to tell you that the Bible in Western thought, we think that sunrise on each morning is the beginning of a new day. That's how we see things. Not so in the Bible. The Bible sees a new day as from um, sunset to sunset. So remember the Sabbath for Jewish people begins on Friday night at sunset and ends on Saturday evening at sunset. Um, and that's where you get this pattern. There was evening and there was morning. So the Bible views a new day to happen at sunset of each day. 
but there's even more of an interesting concept here. We talked briefly of this concept of a broken earth um, that you see in Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, that the waters had to hover over it and replenish it, right, rejuvenate it into what it was supposed to be which is fascinating because you get the same pattern in the book of Revelation, but this time at the end it will be fire that has to burn and consume the brokenness of the earth before it is rejuvenated and renewed and made all new um, for the very final creation that you see in Revelation um, 22. So um, we talked about that concept. I want to tell you that the word um, Arev is evening and the word boker is morning. So um, oh, let me try to erase this a little bit to write these words. So you have arev. I gotta make sure I spell these right for you. Okay, this is evening and boker um, is morning. All right, so boker is morning, arev is evening. A rev um, means evening, and it means the time when um, the sun is going down and things are becoming less and less disting distinguishable. Think about when you're looking out on a field and you can't see well because the sun's going down and you're kind of squinting to see. It means to become less and less distinguishable and originally meant, sorry, try to spell. Chaos, okay? The word is chaos. Boker, on the other hand, is when the sun is coming up and things become once again distinguishable. You can see now and there is order to it. Okay, so you see this concept here um, over and over and you can see that God is creating from chaos order with every single day that he creates life So um, or creates the earth. So at the beginning it's void. It's formless We don't even understand this concept, but then let there be light and we know that by from John 1 that the light is Jesus. And I'll point that out in a minute and we'll find out why that is. But that, that creates more order. The second day, he says, let's the expanse be there. The, the third day comes in. Now let's sprout vegetables. Let's have the earth, um, land come out of the water. He's creating order in the world out of chaos. But you see in every day, a little bit more order, a little bit more order comes in. But on day seven, you don't have that because it has been set right. And God says it is good. He's and he takes a time of resting. You I want to point out that this rest, you will not see God rest in the Bible again. Have you ever thought about that concept? Psalms actually says the God of Israel neither sleeps nor slumber. And I want to present to you that you will not see him rest again until after the great white throne, because at this point, he's resting on that seventh day to make a point that Jesus is coming. Woo, we're going to get into that. But what he's telling us is this is a day of rest, but I will neither sleep nor slumber until every single one of mine is home. You really think about my mom when we were teenagers and we would go out and she couldn't go to sleep until we were done coming home because she would always say, I got to have my little chicks in. Like, I can't have them out. And that's really the picture that I get of Jesus and of God and the spirit here saying, we will not rest until it is all put back to order. The chaos that, um, you have created as mankind, the chaos that Satan and his demons have created. I will not rest until it is put back. And it will be put back. When you get to Revelation and you start reading, there are no more tears. There is no more death for God himself dwells with his people and they will be his people and he will be their God. He will put it all back to order. But until then, he will not rest. So you get this beautiful picture of coming into clarity. From chaos, God brought order every day. So um, we are going to start now. Those are a couple of overviews so that you can see a little bit about what the, um, what's happening. But now let's start breaking this down. In order to do this, all right, 
we're going to, I'm going to see if I can bring this closer. Uh, okay, there we go. I'm going to show you the days of creation. Boom. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Hopefully this will make it a little easier to see. Okay. Here are the days of creation that we have in Genesis 1. I want to go through each day one by one with you. And, um, but I want to tell you that I believe that these days um, on so many different levels are prophetic as well as telling you how God created the world. I'm not actually going to spend time arguing over um, if he did it in 24 hours. He says over and over in the Bible he did it in six days. I'm okay with that. Um, if you're not, um, please go know why. Okay, know what you believe and do the research for it. Um, we've already talked about the possibility that the earth could be really old. Um, it could be really young. Um, it appears, the science tells us that um, the earth is old, and I'm okay with that because Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 give, we have no time. As we're going to find out today, time does not come in until day four, actually, in the scheme of creation. Um, but that I do believe that these are 24-hour days. But I believe they're prophetic for thousands of years of the time of mankind on earth. Um, so... We're going to look at this today, actually, and parallel some of the prophecies in them. You can parallel this. I kind of printed out, where was it? Some of this is, this is a great, um, if you can kind of see this, let me hold that up. This is a really interesting, I did not make this, but if you pause it and look at this for a minute, here's a paralleling of the days with the time of man. So you see down here, which is a 6,000 years, we live really close to this over here because we're waiting for millennial rain to come in. Um, so that's a concept of the ages paralleling the days, um, but I'm actually going to teach today with the festivals of God. I believe that ever there are seven festivals that are laid out in Leviticus 23, um, but I believe actually when we get into this, you're going to find that um, the festivals parallel with the days of creation and that they're prophetic and tell us things. So let's break it down um, that way. All right. I'm going to try to do it fast, too, so the videos aren't so long, um, but I'm, I'm not promising you anything. <laughs> okay, day one. What happens in day one? God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the night... God called light day and the darkness he called light, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So I already kind of referred to in John chapter one, remember that the New Testament is revealing to us the Old Testament, things that were hidden. And John, not by accident, starts his gospel by explaining creation again to us so that we have a better understanding. In beginning was word, right? Um, you had to read it kind of like the in beginning God created. And the word was with God and the word was God. And he was in the beginning. All things were made through him. And without him, not a single thing was made. In him was life. Who is him? Jesus. He's the word of God. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. So we see here, um, right here, and it goes on to say the light of the world. What is the light of men? It is Jesus. When you see on day three, let there be light, Jesus is with him. Jesus literally is the word that is speaking, and he is the light right, of God. So when we, a couple things I want to point out to you of what happens here. One is on day one, God himself decided what would be separated. He separated the light from darkness. I want to tell you that this is not darkness as in turning all the lights off in your room. This is the separation of good and evil.
okay? Good, evil, light, dark. What is God doing on day one? He alone is determining that he is sovereign and he is the judge of all. God has the dominion of everything. Day one, he's telling us, I decided to separate the light and darkness. Man did not get to choose what was good. Oh, sorry, I like choked. What was good and what was bad. God decided it on day one. So he is supreme and he is the judge. And he, so he has judgment and he has dominion. Okay, on day one. Judge and dominion happens, boom, day one. Because I wanna remind you, just for those of you going, wait a minute, I thought this was the sun. <laughs> Sun does not is not um, created until day four. Okay, this is not about the sun and the moon. This is not about what we call light on um, daytime, nighttime, as in our concept. This is about the separating out of God saying, from the beginning, I have decided. I make the laws of everything. I want to tell you that this coincides with the Passover feast. Okay. Go into the book of um, Exodus and read about the Passover feast. If you don't know, the Passover came in when God sent Moses in and he said to, eat, to the Egyptian Pharaoh, let my people go. They've been in slavery now, 430 years total. And um, actually the book of Exodus tells us to the day God decided they got out, which makes me know that God doesn't do anything flippantly. It doesn't maybe happen Tuesday or maybe happen Wednesday for God. He knows the exact hour, the exact minute, the exact moment these things are going to happen, which is another reason why I believe in a 24-hour creation days. But um, Passover is about when judgment, when God was telling Pharaoh, I am the judge. You don't get to decide what's good because having slaves for Egypt is good to you. That doesn't work. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday about Unitarianism and they believe in moral relativity that um, you yourself get to decide that. And this is just eaten up our um, culture right now. But as Mere Christianity points out and C.S. Lewis points out, that works until someone steals your cookie off your plate or someone robs you and you go, how could they? That's my stuff. And all you have to say is really well all morality is relative. So who are you to say it was wrong for him to steal your stuff because to him it was right? Or if you go down that too far, who are you to say Hitler and the Holocaust was wrong because the entire um, country of Germany had decided it was okay, right? Who are we to tell them that? So um, Passover is about God coming into um, Egypt which is representative of coming into the world, to Pharaoh, representative of the um, a prototype for the Antichrist, and saying, you don't get to decide. You might think you're in full power, but I decide. And so he told his people that at night, darkness would come over the land. Realize, once again, we're not talking about the absence of the sun. We're talking about a spiritual um, existence or being of darkness spreading across this land, much like in Genesis day one, the darkness was separated out. And they were told, you must take the blood of the lamb and put it on their doorpost in God's judgment, okay, of killing the first son, because it was judgment on Pharaoh and on all the Egyptians for the evil that they were doing, for the evil of not, um, not basically submitting to God and rebelling against God and saying, no, no, we will be judge. Day one, he says, no way. But out of grace, he will have a plan to save those who will bend their knee and submit under the blood of the Lamb to pass over with light, right? And who is the light of man? Jesus Christ. Who is the Passover Lamb? Jesus Christ. So on day one, you see that these parallel together. Um, and you see that there is from the very first day, a plan of redemption. Jump with me to Revelation 13. 
you see this verse that you could kind of skip over, but Revelation 13, 8. Um, this is where it's talking about the first beast and coming out of the first beast. But it says this, this verse, And all who dwell on earth will worship it, worship the beast. Everyone whose name has not been written, when? Before the foundation of the earth, the world, in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Hear what that verse actually says. Before day one, before Genesis 1-1, before the foundation was poured by God, by Elohim himself, he had the names of his. He had the names in the book and the lamb already slain. He knew on day one when he established the law, when he established, I am God and there is no other. He knew day six was coming. He knew we would need a plan of redemption. And so on day one, he separates out the light from the darkness so that the light of men may come and give them life before the foundation of the world is poured. He has the plan of Passover coming for us. Love it. Then the second day you go and it says, and God said, let there be an expanse. The word for expanse is um, Rika, R-I-Q, um, U-A, U -A, I think. I have it written down somewhere. It's a very interesting concept. Go. I'm not actually going to get into the um, issues of it, but it's a solid foundation. Um, you can get into the space that there is in an atom, and there, there's actually more space in a solid than there is a filling, but we'll, we'll get into that. Um, I won't get into it, actually. You can go look it up. Um, so the expanse in the midst of the water, and it separated the waters from the waters. Okay, <laughs> right? And God made the expanse and separated the waters, and where the expanse of the waters were above the waters in the expanse, and it was so, and God called the expanse heaven. You have on day two, separation of holy from that which is material. I do not believe at this point that, um, see, there is, man has not sinned on earth at this point, so it's not bad, but Satan has. Okay, so sin is already existing at this point if you go with a gap theory. And I want to tell you that this separation that's coming of what's holy from unholy is not split yet. Because on day six, we see the creation of man comes in and even Adam walk with God in the Garden of Eden. They walk with God, whatever that means. Um, I mean, not, well, not, not whatever that means, but they are with him. And when she speaks to Satan, she does not pee her pants right because of a serpent speaking to her so which we'll get into what that word nakash means um but it seems that they were with the angelic so i want to tell you here we have separation okay separation of what is holy on day two of the heavens, okay, um, from the material. You get heaven, which is shamayim, mayim being water, from material earth. Or you could say us, right? There's a separation that happens. I want to tell you that everything he does is in anticipation for Genesis 3, for day 6. He's anticipating that when sin comes into the world, relationship is broken and heaven and earth are split from each other in a way they were not made to be split. And when you get at the end of the book of Revelation, it's back together, that he forms these things back together. Right now, we do not look up and see the heavenlies or the angelic, but Adam and Eve probably did. They were not shocked to have God walk with them or have angels speak to them. And so you see that he's anticipating anticipating that when sin comes into the world, it will break what was once whole. And you'll get this picture. Okay, and so I want to tell you, this one um, coincides with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is the second festival. This is the first one. This is the second one. Unleavened bread is the second festival. It is about taking the leaven, which is sin, which is bad, out, separating it out, okay, um, from that which is good. And you see that in day two. 
Remember that when you get to the, um, the Passion Week for Jesus, it was on Passover that um, he wants to share this Passover meal together, that they take Jesus, they crucify him on the Day of Unleavened Bread because he became sin for us, the sin that is separated out. Jesus became sin. That is what Unleavened Bread is about. Sorry, it's like a light in there. Um, I have like a lightsaber right here. So let's go on to verse um, day three, because I just don't want to get too long for you. Um, there's a lot more in here that I would love to go on, go into, um, but we'll keep on um, moving. Also, I just have to tell you this. Even though it's separated out, the sign of Jonah was that Jesus, um, during this time of unleavened bread, when he's crucified, where does he go? He is in all of these realms, right? He is unifying these realms again through his death by him. A man is now in the heavenlies. And um, Hebrews tells us an interesting thing, that his blood even went into the heavenlies, right? Interesting concept. So day three, Awesome. So in on day three, you have let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. In one place, you have land coming, right? Um, land appeared, and he called the dry land earth, Eretz. And the waters were gathered together, and he called seas. And he said it was good, right? God said, let the earth sprout vegetables, plants yielding seed, and fruit bearing. So on day three, the earth is um, formed, right? or the land, I'm sorry, is formed out of the waters, and something happens. You have vegetation start. You have, I'm going to say this word, the first fruits of the earth come. You have seeds, plants, trees. Whoop, there you go. This corresponds with first fruits. First fruits is the day. This is the third day, remember? Jesus rose from the grave. What does the Bible say? I just love this picture. Jesus says him that Jesus in the Bible is said to be the first fruits among men. Um, John, and you can look it up in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 25. Go read that. I'm not going to go into it, but he is the first fruits among men. Um, and you see this picture that even we're called his first fruits, but that he is the son of God, the firstborn given to die for um, all of creation. When we get into Cain and Abel, we'll go into this a little bit more, but I want to show you something fascinating about these days and why they are done this way. It is really weird. I'm going to just say, whenever the Bible does something weird, stop and ask why. That seeds, plants, and trees are born on day three. It's odd. Um, and I want to tell you that it's because of day one. Because here on day four, this is when the sun and the moon comes in, okay? And we're going to get into this in a minute. You have seeds, plants, and trees before you have the sun. So if you believe these are ages, you got a hard time because a long time it's going to live without the sun. But I want to tell you, I think this is done exactly on purpose by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you why. The first fruits of the earth, which is prophetic for Jesus Christ rising on the third day, on the third day, God would give the first fruit of life unto us. The first fruits come before the sun and the moon. Have you ever seen plants that can um, grow without the sun? No, you have not, because trees don't grow without, um, and you have seeds, plants, trees. See, you have a full progression here, and that these cannot grow without the sun. So how do they do it? Let me tell you how it happens. John 10, 18. This is because of prophecy that this happens. It's prophesying. John 10, 18, this is Jesus speaking. No one takes 
my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. The charge I received from my father. You have the prophetic day, the third day of first fruits without the sun, because it is by the light of Jesus Christ alone that these plants grow. The purpose of this is the Holy Spirit telling you when Jesus comes to die, it is not by the sun uh, that I created so you can explain it away that you can say, well, that's science. This is not science. This is adverse to science here. Why? Because he's saying, I lay my life down. By the light of God, these first fruits will be present, presented. And by me, I lay it down. No one takes it from me. Nothing you can explain takes it from me. It was not Pilate who washed his hands of Jesus and said, I don't want to have anything to do with it. It was not the Sanhedrin. It was not the Pharisee or the Sadducee or the people who scream, let his blood be upon me and my children that laid the life down of Jesus Christ. I alone lay my life down, he said it, and I alone will raise it back up. And I believe that is why you get on the third day, the first fruits of the earth came without the sun because it was by the light of Jesus alone of God that the power of this happened because the sun doesn't come till another day and we know by science that's impossible science also says it's impossible for a man to lay dead in his grave for three days and to rise again and yet God did it because before day one came he said I will come I will redeem and I will produce the first fruits of life and start creation again no matter what you believe science says it's an amazing thing I'm going to close it down here because um, the video is getting a little long. And on the next video, I'll finish four, five, six, and seven for you. But thanks for looking at um, days one through three with me. And the next video, we'll look through days four through seven.